Uh, good day, everybody. Welcome to the um, the, the June year, Open Access Year Community Meeting. Uh, today we have a, a couple of presentations. One from um, Manish on like some of our, our GP performance work, and and then Mahesh will be presenting some of the work we've been doing with respect to like the map kernel integration mechanisms. Um, and then afterwards, of course, we will have some time for like general Q and A if folks have any and of course there's a form etc etc uh but perhaps to get us all started you know um manish I'll, I'll hand it over to you to to kick us off sounds good uh so i am sharing my screen you can see the slides yep um so you see the batman performance slides right uh, yes, we do. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you so much uh, for coming in. Uh, this is Banish, and uh, I will be presenting Magma Performance work that we have been doing. Uh, most of the stuff that I will be presenting here is uh, we have talked in OpenXLA Summit. I will, I do, will go deeper in how did we construct these. Uh, deeper fine grained schedule. So uh, there are a few slides which are new for the people who have heard the Open XLA Summit. Uh, uh, part of it will be, uh, there will be some overlap. Uh, so we've been working on MATMAR performance in ED code gen, and this is the work with my colleagues here and our external collaborators. So thank you so much for all the work you've been doing. So, um, yeah, before I begin to the performance, I want to go over this uh, pyramid and then different ways we can uh, achieve performance on uh, uh, on different set of hardware like uh, latest bleeding edge hopper and ampere and others uh, focusing uh, specifically say on NVIDIA GPUs. So this slide shows the, the pyramid uh, with various sources where these kernels can come from. So as we move from the base to the apex of the pyramid, uh, we are moving from uh, generating to developing kernels uh, to using kernels. Uh, you get more performance on common use cases on bleeding edge hardware when you uh, 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 when you are at the, the the apex of the pyramid or at the top. On the base of the pyramid, uh, you improve ex extensibility, fusion opportunities, and collaboration, and you get more coverage. And with libraries, for example, here, Kublas and Kudin, and one gets the performance on common use cases on bleeding edge hardware, but you don't get the extensibility on common use case, uncommon use cases, and lose uh, possible collaborating opportunities with the library vendors because these are closed source. Uh, and uh, you are basically governed by the, the release cycle of this library. So if you want to innovate, there are uh, 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 places where people are moving to like you know, code generation, Triton, and then Cutlass where your handwriting kernels. Uh, I hear there is a hand raise. Yeah, yeah there's there's a thing if, you could, if you could go full, go screen, full screen, screen on the slides. Okay. Is it better? Great. Uh, so yeah, um, more on the base of the pyramid, like for example, ED code gen and Triton, like uh, code generation is possible when you know the kernel you're trying to generate for the performance. So the performance uh, catches up through libraries, but uh, that's still great. It gives you a lot of fusion opportunities and on different part of those uh, code generation pipeline, different engineers can work. Uh, uh, we here in OpenXLA looking at all three levels, uh, and um, uh, these are the like various levels. You have OpenXLA plugin where we are uh, mapping into libraries. We look into Cutlass, how we can use Cutlass and code writing techniques, and then of course MLIR based uh, uh, code generation techniques. And as you can see that. Uh, as you go lower in the, the pyramid, you get more and more entry points. So you have more and more visibility into how your, your, your operation is loaded into a PTX. Like for libraries, you just take the operation and you just make a library call and 
library does things for you if uh, it finds the best kernel and it runs and it's great but if you want to do something more then you will basically need to make requests to the library providers uh, with handwritten kernels and when they are in open source you can go in and change things at thread block warp level to get the ptx that you need with code generation you have more fine grain controlled uh, and all of these uh, dots that you see you can read the ir and different engineers can work on different part of these irs as well mm, so here i would like to like make an analogy uh, that like if llms are like running a refrigeration plant then applications are like chatbots and are like ice creams and the ai researchers like all over like google deepmind open ai anthropic everywhere they are trying to create different flavors of these ice creams like different data types mixing different data types so bf16 within tate somebody might have some other recipes so we have to enable all of these researchers to try all of their recipes and uh, i think libraries are great uh, but it is hard to give all these researchers uh, ways and to try their recipes if it's just a library based approach we need some sort of code generation where where different recipes can be mixed together uh, 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 by these researchers opaque to them uh, but still generate a performant code or close to a performant code uh, So focusing just on the code generation part of it, uh, these are the performance numbers first. So we uh, have been uh, moving from WMMA based uh, uh, MacMul kernels to MMA sync uh, okay, MacMul kernels. So the gray bar here is just showing from where we started and where we are uh, now with WMMA to, to MMA sync. Uh, you see two data types, FP16 and FP32 Ampere tensor cores. So gray bar is WMMA, and then the green bars are uh, Kublas and Cutlass. Uh, and um, uh, this is a large MacMul, uh, and we are running a tile size, uh, large tile, tile size 128 by 256 uh, to, to uh, uh, effectively reach uh, and close the gap and have... Uh, uh, the code generated generated code, which is shown by the the blue bar, uh, close to the green bars. Um, just by replacing uh, uh, WMMA with MMA Sync will not get you the 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 top performance. Like MMA Sync is a fast math instruction, but you have to keep these these math instruction fed and. Uh, uh, remove all the other 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 bottlenecks that are there in the system. You you may have back conflicts when you're using WMMA because the WMMA is not consuming the the registers at a speed uh, uh, that back conflicts and other things will come into picture. So when using uh, MMA sync, you have to make sure the bank conflicts, uh, your pipeline is uh, shared memory bank conflict free. You have optimal instruction scheduling. So your math instructions are always fed. And this is what this graph is showing that if you take the gray bar with the WMMA and replace it with just uh, base MMA sync instruction, you are not getting much speed up. In some cases, there is like a slowdown as well with some tile size. Uh, then you do some coarse grain scheduling, which I will go next. And then some fine grain scheduling, which really pushes the envelope and gets you the the, the next level of performance. So if we look at, uh, 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 like, let's take this example. The figure here is to scale. I am taking a thread block tile of 128 by 128 by 64, a warp tile of 64 by 64 by 16, and you're running a math instruction of MMA sync of 16, 8, 16. You have four stage pipeline, and you have multiple copies of data in in flight so you are loading way ahead in in uh, you're loading from global to shared memory way ahead and then you are doing your math and you're doing you do you're loading your data from shared memory into registers and then you are issuing some math on top of it so basically this 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 is like a just basic software pipelining uh, where you are loading some 
uh, where, where you are having in prologue you are loading lo uh, like there are four stages so you are loading three stages in the prologue you are waiting for uh, at least one stage to be committed then in the main loop you are uh, loading uh, you're issuing your ld matrices to load all your data to load the data for a stage into your registers and then you're issuing a bunch of every sync and then you're loading your next uh, next pipeline stage and then you're just looping over and once you're done the epilogue collectively stores a 128 by 128 uh, accumulator thread block into the memory so each thread basically shows its part of 128 by 128 so this will get you some speed up but will not get you entirely there to 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 reach where uh, you see in the graph you have to do the fine grain scheduling where you basically take these um, ld matrices and mms sync and you interleave them and now in the main loop uh, your main loop is uh, is loading data from global to shared memory is loading data from shared memory to register and doing math all at the same time so they are they are doing it at the same time and you have uh, three stages that are loaded you have as soon as one stage is loaded outside the main loop you are issuing some ld matrices to uh, collectively load a warp tile of 64 by 16 for a and 16 by 64 for b uh, you have this which is loaded which is basically this section here on this uh, figure or like one of these slices. so there are four four of these slices four k groups so you are loading one of that uh, uh uh before even beginning the main loop in the main loop you load the next section so you basically if outside the main loop you loaded uh, this section uh i don't know if people see my pointer do you see my mouse it's a little bit difficult to see for me but I i'm far away okay so this this is uh, this is outside the main loop you load the first part let's i think typically this is called like a k tile and then one of this there are four k groups in it so you are loading the first k group outside and then you go inside the main loop you load the next k group you haven't started mma yet now this math is basically doing the mma on the data that is loaded here on the outside this the next mma is doing the data on this load and then so on uh, you issue all the all the all the MMA instructions, but you have now interleaved these uh, load matrices and MMA instruction. You issue the copy copies from the global to shared. You wait, and then this load matrix is basically loading the data into registers for the next stage. Uh, and then this MMA is happening for the data that is loaded here, and then you go so on. So this is the instruction schedule that will get you the 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 peak performance. And to get here, I think the first thing is to knowing that schedule that works for NVIDIA A100 Tensor course. And second is to actually code generate it in MLIR. So you need to do the two things to get there. And uh, so that's why like writing kernels by hand and then code generating both are important. I think code to, to try and code gen all of these schedules and figuring out the best, best schedule in code gen will be very hard. It would be you need to write this schedule for maybe for one data type to get an understanding what kind of instruction schedule is working on your piece of hardware and then take that schedule and then uh, uh, code gen it uh, uh, so that it can be scaled to multiple data types and then you throw in fusion for free uh, so this is the basic matmal and then after that you have to you can go depth or or width uh i been what i've been showing is mostly depth part of it so main loop instruction scheduling uh address arithmetic we have touched a bit on that i have not covered in this slide uh then rounding and epilogue uh with width you have batch matmal which we have also supporting now with performance and split k uh is also there we have making some improvement in split k uh the unaligned matmal and then mixed data types is what we are working next so on batch matmal this is uh the performance like uh, for the generated code with the batch matmal the performance is again very close to uh, the handwritten code and the 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 libraries on the split k uh on on split k 
uh, we have uh, done some experiments to figure out, okay, we really need split case. So this is a size where you have, uh, 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 this is running on a 128 by 128. And then the K dimension is an increasing uh, uh, problem K dimension. So if you just look at the last one, you have uh, 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 you have 128 by 128 and a very large K. So if you don't do any split K, you're just running one thread block and uh, you're not utilizing the, the power of your A100, which is 108 SMs. So you have to give all 108 SMs or as many as possible some work. So we split the K dimension, this 12288 dimension to create more thread blocks. And that's how you get more performance. And then uh, Kublas uh, chooses some split factor by itself. For Cutlass, I sweep through the split K parameters and choose the best split K for a 128 by 128 tile. And that's where you see the performance. If you don't do any split K in the code generation, that's where your performance will be and it will be terrible. Uh, and that's what just magnifying the, the last uh, uh, problem size. Uh, now, after some perform per functional fixes and performance fixes, uh, and the split K performance with code generation is uh, also pretty good and close. Uh, there are some things that we are fixing that we are not able to use all these split K values. And then uh, here is a, a, a PR or a bug or an issue that we are working on if you want to contribute to that. And um, then we are focusing on mixed data types. Uh, and I would like to classify mixed data types as mixed precision data type and mixed input data types. Mixed precision data types are where your input and uh, accumulation and output data types are different, which is shown like the first one, FP16 input, FP32 accumulation, and then FP32 output. This is almost done and should be merged maybe today or tomorrow. Uh, next, we are looking at uh, BF16 input and then FP32 output. This is in process. We are trying to get uh, BF16 to work either through inline ASM or either through uh, NVVM, the um, backend the for which nvidia has a pr uh, then there will be more mixed precision data types where you have uh, input uh, 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 as a lower lo lower bit width you have you're still accumulating in fp32 but the epilog just before writing is writing in a lower precision to the output which is uh, uh, fp16 and then finally we want to get to a mixed input data type which is bf16 as uh, operand a int 8 as another operand and uh, you're outputting in bf16 um, so I guess that's all I had. If there are any questions, I can maybe quickly show a quick demo if you see the screen. Do you see the screen? Um, we did, yes. Um, so like I'm just showing the generated code here uh, is the fine grain pipeline that we just talked about. So this is the fine grain pipeline. So you see that we are, this is outside the main loop. We are issuing a bunch of copy asyncs and then we have LD matrices. Here are the eight LD, LD matrices for A and B, four for each. And then here is the main. Here is where the main loop is starting. Uh, then you have again some LD matrices uh, interleaved with so 32 MMA sync, uh, which are accumulating. These MMA syncs are basically accumulating on the registers that have been loaded by uh, uh, an LD matrix, like a skipped one, like this one. So you have that. Uh, then you are again have some LD matrices and then MMA sync. And then again, LD matrices, MMA sync, these are basically interleaved. If you put them together, you will not get the performance that you saw. And then you have copy async. Another improvement can be that you have to also sprinkle these copy asyncs across the loop. But I have to check SAS. Maybe the these copy asyncs in, in SAS are already already like dispersed along the main loop. They should not be all concentrated at one place so that they can be issued 
like uh, they can be kept issuing and then you when you're ready you have already loaded the data from for the next stage and this ld matrix are uh, matrix after the stage one of the stage is now loaded within the main loop is for the for the next part uh then you issue some more mma sync for the last last part and then you will loop back at some point and then this is the epilogue uh and we have a profiler which you can use so here you generate it so i'm showing the command to command to generate it it has generated bunch of uh matmuls for you in linux then you can compile it uh and using using a compile flag and then if you try and run it uh e, this is basically just running and showing the performance that was just show and you can run it yourself at your end so this is the 233 or 234 teraflops that we have been showing in the graphs just just a uh, minute ago it's running a large macmul with a tile size of 128 by 256 uh, uh and 32k tile and three stages and this is the performance so i, I have a question yes so um, when you say you needed to mix that uh, async copy with that, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the loader matrix and then the MMA, um, how mm -hmm. do you decide? You right now you are doing um, kind of uh, you know like uh, automatically using compiler to schedule it, or you manually decide it some way? Uh, like right now the compiler does it. Like you take the core. Cool uh, you intercept the IR at NVGPU dialect, and uh, you create that fine grained schedule uh, 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 at the NVGPU dialect level. So when you say you create, so it's like a compiler yeah. knows how to the best create this mix. Um, you have to tell the compiler. I mean, uh, you cannot expect a compiler to 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 generate all possible schedules and figure out which one is the best in my opinion i think mm -hmm. you need to know that this is the best best schedule uh, i think it's a very hard problem in my opinion for letting compiler to figure out what's the best set best, best schedule especially when there are instructions which does not have uh, like load instructions with not fixed latency asynchrony in the in the in your in your pipeline so uh, so so you have so the way you figure it out is that you handwrite for one data type that's that's i think that's the approach handwrite these kernels for one data type figure out what sort of schedule is working and then you 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 pour that knowledge into the compiler to 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 code gen that schedule for you uh, if you want compiler to do that that there are too many possible interleaving of instructions that functionally correct that compiler may try and then compute a cost uh, and if it's a fixed cost model you can do that but uh, when the like cost there is no fixed cost model for these instructions then it's very very hard in my opinion for a compiler to figure out so, uh, um, so what's your compiler mean like you mean like low level or are you i, I was referring certain mir pass is a compiler so I was thinking you are doing in the MRR. Yes, side, yeah, right? we are so, doing it. We are yes. doing it. Uh, this coarse grain and fine grain scheduling is happening in MLR. So when you refer to compiler, you really refer to the low-level compiler, so not the MRR. So yourself is doing compiler. So you are the MRR compiler is figuring this out, right? Uh, I think that is, uh, one, one way to say that is. There is, we know a known good instruction schedule, and we know that if you're targeting A100, you can go from, at some level of your code generation, when you have access to the exact instructions that you have, you use pipelining to kind of schedule it explicitly. So it's not like there is an automatic scheduler within the compiler that is figuring out through mm -hmm. some analysis that this is the ideal sequence, kind of the sequence is known for this architecture. So it's being uh, used uh, in uh, that's being right. kind of hardcore and compiled. Yeah. 
So you need a, yeah, some yeah. kind of high level representation so that you can mechanically lower to this representation with that, this knowing recipe. That or exists that other one. in the, that's the NVGPU dialect. So there is a compiler you have the high level representation, which is either the vector contract or the NVGPU dialect that gives you the high level representation. And when you go from there to the actual sequence of instructions, you can schedule it this way. All right. OK, thanks. Awesome. Um, if anybody has any other questions, uh, please raise your hand now. Uh, I'll also, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit on like, some of the microkernel work and, and the mechanisms to, to enable that. Uh, but just in case anybody has any questions, we can of course follow up offline as well. But all right, awesome. Thank, thank you, Manish. That was that was very you know useful. It's, it's great to, to see all this and all the different scheduling being used here. Um, and now up next we have um, uh, Mahesh presenting some of the work uh, to enable microkernels and sort of the, the infrastructure to hook, hook all of that up. All right, thank you, Jack. Uh, let me go up to the slide. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, thanks, everyone. So uh, I can't see my presentation slides. So if there's any question, either Jack or someone, please uh, prompt me. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the work we've been doing in the EV compiler to call microkernels from Cogen backends. Uh, just to set up the motivation behind this, uh, compilers are really good at high level transformation. So for example, if you take a, a mammal followed by a bias ad as a simple example, it, we have very good mechanism to do high level transformations like tiling and distribute. So this is kind of a little bit, a lot of IR here, but effectively what what it's doing is it is distributing your Linage mammal into different tiles and executing them on different threads. So what you see is the code extracting slices that you need to perform a tile of the computation, doing the computation, and writing the tile back into uh, the final result. The compiler is also very good at adding fusion to it. So you could fuse the bias add uh, that the tiled computation of the bias add with the tile computation of matrix multiply so that you fuse at a tile granularity. We can also do other data layout transformation in a compiler where you can do a uh, packing of your left-hand side, right-hand side, so that you have uh, good accesses for your innermost kernel. So this is work that uh, we've done in the context of the Linalge MT4D work, where you would pre-pack your data, call the tile computation of the matrix multiply to do uh, to have less more determinism in the access pattern of your uh, program. But where does a compiler have trouble? The compile the hardest problem in a compiler is to generate a tight inner loop where you have the exact scheduling and uh, register allocation that you need to maximize performance. This is the kind of thing that Manish was describing for the CUDA side of things. The same uh, problem happens on x86, on ARM. You want a very tight sequence of instructions that are maximizing your register usage, but not spilling. And this is especially critical for gem-like computations where you have to uh, really hit the limit of how much registers you use within the innermost loop. And also getting the right instruction sequence, inserting prefetches, all these are hard problems for a compiler traditionally. Uh, some of the times we can rely on LVM to do a decent job, uh, but some of the times that can, it's not always going to hit the right sweet spot. So one way to get around this is, is there a question? Okay. So one way to get around this is that, uh, there are experts in the domain who understand what is the exact sequence of instructions you want to generate in your innermost loop for, for different computation domains, like GEMS, for example. And you can leverage those by packaging those instruction sequences into a microkernel and having the compiler call into these microkernels. So this is the motivation to why we wanted to have a way to call in microkernels within the code generation backends. And I'm going to talk a bit more uh, just before I go over that. Ideally, you want to combine the high-level transformations that the compiler can do, like tiling, distribution, fusion, packing, everything, and use the microkernel for the innermost loop body so that you have more deterministic performance uh, from the generic code. Uh, 
So before I go ahead, I can pause for a question here. Uh, if not, I can go into the mechanism that we built to do this microkernel offload. So the, the basic support is done through use of uh, an interface and, and ops that implement this interface. Uh, so the interface that we added in Eevee for now is the microkernel op interface. It's fairly simple right now. It doesn't do much. It's effectively just a way to call uh, a method that lowers the microkernel into a function call. And it'll become clear why this is done through an interface as I go through the, go through the slides. Uh, you could have many different operations that implement this interface. Today in tree, we have only a, sing only a single operation called microkernel generic op that implements this interface. And the role of these ops are to effectively capture enough information from the IR at the time that they are inserted into the IR to be lowerable into a function dot, into a func dot call operation, which is the call into the microkernel that implements uh, whatever functionality is being captured by this operation. Uh, the interface just allows you a general way in, for the compiler to, to lower all the microkernel ops into a function call. And uh, while today we have only a single op that uh, is one way of matching, uh, getting the func.call that you want, uh, you could have many different ways of doing that. Uh, and that could be added as we go along. But for the purposes that we have today in, in, in tree, uh, there's a single operation that's enough. Uh, and I'm going to go through the mechanism of how this uh, generic op works uh, and captures all the information that it needs to lower into the call to the microkernel. So to start with the example, uh, this is an example that is checked in in tree. Uh, you start with a dispatch. Uh, to give some context, a dispatch is what is uh, offloaded to the device for execution. So if your input IR has a dispatch where it is taking a slice of your operands and doing some computation, uh, in this case, it's just doing a simple multiply of the left-hand side and the right-hand side and writing into a destination uh, tensor. The microkernel op that you see here is the uh, microkernel generic op that I described earlier. It has a few fields. It has it takes some operands. I'll go into more detail here. Uh, in, in the next few slides, but the thing to uh, just to set a high level stage of what's going on here, this op is a vehicle to call into the microkernel that we want to use. So it has the same name, the simple mul work group, which is to say that this is doing multiply at the level of for a single work group. Uh, the operation takes two tensor inputs of uh, the left hand side and the right hand side. So the microkernel signature has a pointer and offset for the left-hand side, a pointer and offset for the right-hand side. And then the result is written into uh, uh, another tensor, a 1D tensor. So the microkernel signature has uh, the pointer offset for the result. And there's an extra argument size, which is some information that the microkernel needs to do the computation. Uh, the return value of the microkernel itself is just error code. Uh, so apart from that, all the the in the actual input and output is actually passed in through uh, to as buffers to the microkernel operation. Yeah, so, that that size size operand list could contain anything. So depending on your kernel, you might pass you know data types to use or algorithms to use or or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it could be anything. And uh, uh, what is this? So I had something else that I want to add to it. I kind of lost my train of thought there. Uh, so yeah, so this is the high level picture. We want to go from this microkernel that it, it in a deterministic way, we can go from the microkernel op that is specified here to the function call that we want. Uh, and that's basically the crux of the work. So the op has many different, has a few fields and operands. This is just taken from the table and definition of the op, and I'm going to go through each one of these. What are the different uh, operands for this op? It has an attribute, a string attribute called to represent the name of the microkernel that needs to be invoked. It has a variadic list of inputs. Uh, these inputs could be of any type. Uh, so they could be like scalars or they could be tensors, but they are really read-only operands to the microkernel operation. 
it has another variadic list where the type has to be a uh, tensor memref. Uh, this is called the output list. And this is the way the operation implements the destination passing style uh, that exists upstream in MLIR. And the reason why this is done is it works well with the bufferization that the uh, that the uh, compiler needs to do to convert your tensor program into memref program. Uh, and I'll go into a bit more detail of that in the next slide. The last list you see here is other operands, which is really just input. But this is just a way in which you can have some degree of freedom into where your inputs are and where your outputs are. So it's not necessary that you have a fixed position of where your outputs are. If your outputs are somewhere in the middle, you can have a list of inputs, outputs, and some other operands that are effectively inputs. So it just gives you a degree of freedom. Uh, so apart from that, it's not more load bearing than that. Uh, so going back to the bufferization question, uh, the input, the microkernel op starts with being defined on tensor semantics. Uh, this is useful because one, most of the program that ED gets as input is in tensor semantics, so this meshes well with that. And the other advantage is if in your compilation flow you have to recognize a sequence of operations, a DAG of operations that you want to offload to a microkernel, doing that match on a tensor semantics using SSA USTEF chains is much easier than doing this on uh, memory for plans using uh, because you'll have to do side effect analysis and all of those things. So doing that kind of match is easier on tensor semantics. So we start with the tensor semantic op. Uh, and that's where the destination passing style comes in. The semantics of destination passing style operations is that the out list is has operands of the same type as the result. So here there is one result, which is a 1D tensor, and the out s has a has a single tensor of the same type. Uh, and during bufferization, they both get collapsed. So percentage four and percentage three in the tensor semantics get mapped to the same memref so that you can do in place objects. So this, uh, we can just use the destination style interface to kind of do this transformation in a way that works for any microkernel law. Now we're getting closer to what we actually want to the final signature. So we have two inputs which are 1d memrefs we have an output and we have the size up, size operand that needs to be passed the next step is to actually lower this memref version of the microkernel op into a function call if you use the default memref abi that exists upstream uh, we will not be able to get the pointer and offset semantics that the microkernel implementation expects uh, because the default ABI is more general purpose. So it has things like base pointer, align pointer for alignment. It has sizes and strides and offset. Uh, so we can't use that in general. Uh, the, the advantage of going through the microkernel op and microkernel interface is that allows us explicit control on the specific ABI that we want to target. So here we want to target uh, pointer and offset. That's, the, uh, that's what the microkernel expects. The, the microkernel generic op that we have in ED today, by default, it uses a pointer offset and a list of strides, the strides representing the stride in each dimension. But the number of stride values that you that you pass, uh, that you get during the lower input function call can be controlled by the by the by the attribute, which is the stride outer dims. So in this case, the microkernel doesn't expect any stride inputs. Uh, so you can just set the stride outer dims to zero, and then that boils down to just you getting the pointer and the offset. Uh, so in your microkernel function, every everywhere you see a memref, it gets lowered to a pointer offset. Uh, so now how do we get the actual pointer offset? Uh, for that, we use the instruction, uh, the operation extract time metadata that lives in the memref dialect in MLIR, which allows you to get the pointer offset sizes and strides of any member. So going back to the uh, example that we had, we use the extract style metadata. We get the left hand, the op pointer and the offset for each of the operands, and then we pass it in to the function call. So this is the a this matches exactly the ABI that we are trying to hit uh, 
for the uh, uh, microkernel that we want to invoke. So there's no extra logic that we need to inject into this. The definition of the microkernel operation is just taken and there is just a sequence of manual steps that are done to hit the ABI that the microkernel is expecting on the on the caller side, the callee side. And, and the important thing there is because there's no need for custom ops and, and implementations, a uh, stock build of Erie compile can take input with one of these microkernel ops and just work. Uh, so a compiler plugin that's at before the Erie compile step is able to produce these microkernel ops. Uh, it can have its own ops, its own dialects, and things like that. Uh, but by the time it gets to the actual compiler, it's just just this op. Uh, no need to link in a bunch of additional stuff. Right. Uh, the one gotcha here that the, that you need to be aware of is comes down to memory semantics. The memory semantics in MLIR is not your traditional pointer. You can't take a pointer and do an offset or do gap on it. It's basically the offset, the stride information is all embedded in the type of the IR. So if you look at the input op, the ins list in the microkernel op, uh, it has information on the stride and the offset. Uh, when you do the extract side metadata, you now decoupled it. You've taken the base out from, and the offset is two separate values. But it is important for these to go, to go together because in general, those two are tightly coupled. Uh, and you need to use both on the caller side, on the callee side to get to the actual data that you want. Uh, so any microkernel operation that exists that implements in the interface needs to keep the base pointer and offset as a pair. It can lead to some very strange behavior if you don't account for both of these. Uh, and I explicitly do the pointer offset in your in the call. Uh, maybe there's a better way of making sure that these are always together. That way, it's uh, it's 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 always done by construction, and you get more guarantees. There, that currently, at least we don't know of any mechanism that exists that gives you that. So for now, we just ensure that every time you keep the pointer and offset together during the compilation flow. Uh, but once there's a better mechanism, we can adapt to that. Uh, finally, how do you link in the microkernel call? This is what Ben was talking about. There are two mechanisms, and these are listed mostly in order in which they were done in Erie. There is a general plugin mechanism that I have the link for that allows you to build your microkernel as a plugin that's effectively an external library that you can link in with the code that is generated from Erie. Uh, and you can specify where the plugin lives through a flag, which is the executable plugin. Uh, and then your generate code has a call to that function. And then you have, it basically goes into your plugin to execute the call. And then you get back to the generate code. This works mostly as good as you would expect. The only thing uh, that you will have on top, only uh, overhead you have is the overhead of an actual function call. So you have a function call in your innermost loop, which might be important uh, depending on your deployment scenario. Uh, so to, to avoid these function call overhead, we can also uh, provide the definition of the function as bitcode. So there is a linking step that happens in during the compilation flow of uh, ERI. So you, the ERI generate code will have will will basically look the same, except that the linking happens at LLVM bitcode level. And using LLVM's optimizations and compilations, we can inline the definition of the function if you're if there are many different uh, variants of the different microkernel functions that you have, and you uh, you you want only one specific implementation of the microkernel based on the architecture targeting, for example, uh, all of that can be resolved statically now because we know what target we are compiling for. Uh, so you can inline the exact version of the microkernel you want, and everything else gets dead code eliminated. So this is the more efficient way of uh, handling microkernels. Uh, and today there's a flag uh, which allows you to provide the Bitcore implementation of the microkernel to Eevee, and Eevee will link it at LVM IR level and inline everything so that you don't have the function call over. Uh, and just to wrap up, most of this work was done in service of the data tiling work that we're pushing on. 
uh, the microkernel itself is built as a separate mechanism that exists in general, but it's being used in a load bearing way for the data tiling work that we will discuss more uh, in one of the future meetings with more numbers and state of the of this work. Uh, but the overview of that is we start with the knowledge manual. We use data tiling to prepack our our op rank so that we have a we have a deterministic memory access pattern for our enum for for the matrix multiply kernel that is staged through the Linalge MP4D op, and uh, there if you then add the if you enable the use of microkernels, the Linalge MP4D gets lowered to the microkernel generic op that that I described earlier, calling into calling the ed micro mu k MP4D kernel that is. Uh, provided as bit code to the compiler ex using the microkernels that uh, live in tree. Uh, and those are linked in depending on whether you're compiling for x86 or you're compiling for ARM, different versions of the microkernel bit code gets linked in uh, to resolve the call to the microkernel function and you get uh, effectively inline assembly for the, for the, for the innermost loop. So this is what we've been using it for. Uh, the microkernel itself is built as a general approach that we could use for any different use cases, but it's being used in a load-bearing fashion for this part. Uh, so what are the next steps here? Uh, we do want to generalize the offload mechanism to make it uh, more uh, customizable, for lack of a better word, from, uh, from use case scenario. Uh, ben has filed a issue that details how you could lift the microkernel out of what, like today the microkernel operations are supported from within the dispatch, which is effectively device side code, uh, but we could extend it so that your input program could have entire layers that you want to offload to microkernels uh, at the innermost loop level. And then we can plumb it through the compiler so that you can get the fusion, the uh, distribution mechanism that exists in the compiler, but still call the tightly written innermost loop, uh, and kind of you, that gives you an uh, escape hatch of using sidestepping the default code generation that easy does if that doesn't match the use case that you're looking for. Uh, that's a little bit more long term. It's not something that uh, we are pushing on immediately, something that we want to do in in course of time. Uh, but in terms of basic functionality for using microkernels, uh, most of it already exists and is, is usable. So if anybody has some interesting use cases that they want that they have for using this mechanism and are interested, we're happy to make that happen and, and can adapt what we have to suit the, that use case. So that's the end of what I want to do talk about today. I mean, I'll, I'll, thank you very much. I mean, I think there, this is, you know, uh, quite interesting. A lot of mechanisms at play here, you know, from, from both build time, run time, compile time, you know, so nice to see how all this fit together. Um, So I mean, I'm actually curious. Like, uh, what more general usages do you have in mind? I mean, like, so as presented, you know, the the the, the case for the inner loop of the MATMO uh, seems supported, but you know, with respect to the the pass and whatnot, uh, where else do you see this being applied? So there are a couple of places. One is what does the comp the compiler by itself says? I'm going to offload to the microkernel. That is a decision that will be kind of part of the compilation flow in ED, but also would be useful to have a way in which it could be something that is user driven. The user can say, I have a specific DAG of operations, flash attention, for example. You could take flash attention and say, if you see a sequence of operations that represents a flash attention, uh, I have the innermost loop that is uh, that ex implements that the tile or the innermost loop of a flash attention uh, operation, we could have the mechanism in which you could let the compiler take that DAG of operations, convert it into uh, a, an op 
that kind of carries this information still allows you to do fusion and distribution, but then offloads to the microkernel implementation for the inner uh, So that would be the generalization of this work. You could also intercept it. That, that is the cleanest way where you intercept it at the full program level outside of anything that ED does in terms of splitting the work into host and device and stuff. There's also an interesting case of where you could go uh, one level deeper, like within the compiler, if you know that you have uh, a microkernel for something that is that is more efficient than what ED generates, that's the way to inject. There's a way to inject that code. Again, it's an arbitrary tag, but it's a little bit more uh, restrictive because you are still relying on ED to form the host device separation uh, for then offloading to the microkernel. So doing it at the full program level is probably the path we, place we want to reach so that that gives the full generality of this. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, so if anybody has any more questions, like please feel free to follow up. I mean, we, we have the, um, the, the external chat room, the VMDX room is actually quite active. And even though the name is specific, there's a lot of general microkernel micro discussion actually going on in that one uh, that, that folks can, can join. Um, our, our next community meeting, well, actually, I should say, like, if anybody from the community has any other questions, like, feel free to interrupt now as well. Um, our, our next community meeting will be uh, uh, the, the, the second week of, of July. So the, the first week, you know, it, it's, it's a shorter week due, due to the, the uh, holiday this side. Uh, and we'll bump it one week later. Um, and well, I'll try and schedule it a little bit earlier than, and send out emails earlier than I did this time. Uh, but yeah. With that, I just want to say thank you again to the speakers. You know, I really enjoyed all the presentations. Um, and then looking forward to seeing everybody externally and in the next meeting. Thank you.